everybody. Uh, I want to thank Aldo, uh, Father Kevin, uh, Stephen and Santa Clara Magazine, uh, and most of all, all of you for being here today uh, to hear more about what we're doing at Santa Clara. Uh, and I'm honored to be uh, chosen to, to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work that I do. So my work explores the ethics of emerging technologies, but for the past few years, it's been the ethical implications of artificial intelligence that everyone uh, from academics to industry to government and policymakers have been most interested in hearing about. And uh, so it's the subject actually of my next book. My first book really looks at the kinds of moral frameworks that we bring to our interactions with technology. Uh, but there's an incre incredible demand today uh, to hear more about artificial intelligence specifically, to hear more about what kind of future we can expect with it. So this presentation quickly explores some of the themes of that book. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a deeper discussion with you uh, and, uh, and with Mike Malone during the Q&A. So, my talk is about the future of AI, what we can expect from it, and perhaps most of all, who is responsible for it. So what should we expect? Because depending on who you listen to, and some of you may have heard some of uh, these uh, extreme statements being made about AI, uh, some people would have you believe that it's the solution to all human problems, while others would tell you that it's essentially doomsday on a chip. So part of my work uh, seeks to kind of bring more reasonable, informed perspectives on artificial intelligence uh, to uh, industry, to policymakers, to academics, and to citizens generally who need to think about uh, how to govern uh, a ethical future with artificial intelligence. So let's start by asking this question, what is AI? Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. So, in the field of artificial intelligence, we make a distinction between the kind of what we call narrow AI, or sometimes we say task-specific AI, uh, that exists now and that will only get better in the coming decades. This is the kind of AI that many of you already interact with on a daily basis, often without realizing it, the kind of AI many of you are carrying in the phones in your pockets right now. That kind of AI is the kind that has exploded in sophistication and capacity over the past five to 10 years, and that we expect to get uh, rapidly uh, more powerful and sophisticated. The other kind of AI, though, uh, what we call AGI, or artificial general intelligence, is a purely theoretical, at this point entirely fictional idea of a kind of machine intelligence that would be like ours. Right, the kind of human-level intelligence that could function just as a human mind does. That kind of AI, and I speak here not just from my own view, but from the view of the leading AI researchers who are trying to build the next generation of AI, that kind of AI is not coming anytime soon. And so some of the hype and the fears that we hear about AI are based upon a scenario that even the best AI researchers think is, is unrealistic. Okay, so then what is AI, right? Some of you here are uh, old enough like me to be familiar with this guy, right? It's not, it's not like this. It's not a mind. It's not a consciousness embedded in silicon. Or maybe some of you, when you think of AI, think of something like this, uh, a more recent uh, fictional example from the movie Ex Machina. Uh, we don't need to be worried about sentient androids like those we encounter in science fiction using their human level intelligence or even greater intelligence to out outsmart us and carry out their own secret ag agendas, right? That makes great movies. It doesn't make for great policy or thinking about the reality confronting us. But that's not to say there are, aren't a lot of risks and concerns about AI that we need to be acquainted with. So what is AI like? It's more like this. And this, and this. Let me explain these, what might, may seem like strange comparisons to you one by one, okay? And hopefully they'll, they'll make a little more sense. Let's go back to this one. One good way to think about the kind of AI that we have today, the kind of AI that we're gonna see get increasingly powerful is to think about it as machine augmented cognition. Whose cognition is being augmented? Whose thoughts are being improved? Ours. So, in certain activities, the kind that have well-defined goals and fixed rules, like chess and the game of Go, it's true that AI can already leave humans in the dust. That's already happened. And so if you generalize from those cases, you might think that pretty soon AIs will be able to beat us at everything and solve any kind of problem 
or win any kind of game without our help or participation. Now, it's true that repetitive and routine tasks in the workplace will increasingly become automated because a lot of these tasks are the sorts of tasks that narrow AI can get very, very good at very, very fast. But when it comes to genuinely understanding and solving problems in complex and unpredictable real world settings, where there aren't a fixed finite set of rules, where the goals aren't simple and clear, in those settings, which are most of the settings that we interact with, AI will not replicate human minds anytime soon. In those settings, AIs will instead be used more like prosthetics for our brains. They will amplify and extend what intelligent humans can accomplish, augmenting our performance in ways that we could never hope for on our own. AI will help us make new medical and scientific breakthroughs, enable more efficient designs and manufacturing processes, and help us fashion faster and smarter responses to complex threats from pandemics to natural disasters. So there's a lot of good things that we can hope for from artificial intelligence, despite its risks. So let's talk about the kinds of AI uh, that we're going to see more and more of. So we could talk about self-driving cars. This is an interesting example because self-driving cars are a hybrid of the two kinds of AI uh, that I spoke of a moment ago, right? The kind of AI that is uh, uh, really good at playing games like chess and Go and the kind of AI that sort of helps us deal with messy, complex problems. So driving is mostly a well-defined game with clear rules, right? Stay on the road, don't hit anything. So AI-driven cars can actually do a lot without our help because of this. And we'll continue to see a lot more of them. But driving also takes place in an unpredictable environment that machines don't actually understand. So there will still be some limits on what situations an automated car can handle. And that'll be true for a long time. We also will see more and more virtual assistants, uh, like Alexa here, right? Uh, and Echo, these kinds of virtual assistants will continue to aid our daily performance using AI to gather information and carry out particular tasks under our direction. Even more influential, I think, are the kinds of decision support systems that are already operating in lots of systems in ways that are not visible to us. Uh, that we don't have a device that we're interacting with, but we might not realize uh, how much these systems are doing uh, behind the scenes. These kinds of systems are being used already in medical, legal, financial, and other settings to compile and analyze data that would quickly overwhelm a human mind. And these systems can promise to deliver those analyses to us in a way that enables faster and more informed judgments on our parts. So they can augment the performance of doctors. They can augment the performance of your financial advisor. But those humans will still be around for a while. We can also talk about social robots, right? Robots and AI are different things, but they often are combined together. So social robots that are powered by artificial intelligence will be more and more popular. They won't really be our friends or our loving caregivers because they don't love and they don't care. But they will fill in more and more of the gaps where our human friends, family, and caregivers are missing. And whether that's a good thing or a terrible thing is a question that we will need to start asking very soon. Finally, we're going to see an explosion of uses of artificial intelligence in military technology. Here you see an unmanned fighter jet, right? There's, there's nobody home, nobody flying that thing, except a machine. This is a fighter jet developed by the Air Force to function in combat as a, what's called a loyal wingman. That's actually the name of the research project for human pilots. China, the United States, and other nations are investing heavily in AI to magnify and extend human military performance, lowering the cost of going to war and perhaps changing the balance of global powers. Okay. And this is just a f these are just a few of the kinds of AI that we're going to see in our lives. There are five or ten other examples I could have easily given you, and they will expand. So here's the other uh, comparison that I think is helpful. AI is an accelerant. That is, it will fuel whatever social dynamics already exist, speeding them up and powering their spread on unprecedented scales. Think of the role today of automated online bots that were responsible for accelerating the spread of political conspiracies, fake news, and fueling divisive rhetoric in the US and the UK last year in ways that we're only now just beginning to understand. But remember, we already had 
con political conspiracy theories before AI got here. We already had false stories. We already had divisive rhetoric. What AI did is pour gasoline on the fire. And we'll see that in a lot of other ways, too. For example, if you think about the dynamics of rising economic inequality, there's a real risk that AI will function as fuel poured on that fire to amplify that dangerous trend. There's a lot of risks with AI, actually. Um, here's, a, here's a long list. Scholars uh, like myself have written papers on all of these topics and many more. Each of them is, in fact, now its own area of intense study by journalists, social scientists, technologists, and ethicists like me. But think about the fact that all of these are risks that existed in our society already, right? So were these risks created by intelligent machines? No. They're reflections of human social and ethical failures that were already here, but have the potential to be amplified and accelerated by the power of artificial intelligence. So AI makes these risks more urgent and more acute, more important for us to address quickly and wisely. And then finally, here's the third comparison. AI is a mirror. I don't know how many of you recognize this, right? This is from Chicago. Uh, this is the, the famous Bean mirror. So a lot of times we hear about AI as if we can expect it to be an alien mind. But the kind of AI that we have today and the kind that we're going to keep seeing is always a reflection of human-generated data and design principles. Every AI is a mirror of society, although often with strange distortions and magnifications that can surprise and disturb us. So this is why I think the bean is a great image, right? First of all, it doesn't just reflect one of us. It reflects a whole network of societies. And it reflects it in ways that are distorted, surprising, sometimes amusing, uh, and sometimes hard to predict. And this is very much what we are seeing with AI. So look at these headlines. These are all headlines that have come out in the past year or two about AI. Note the way that they attribute racist, sexist, or other unethical vices to the machines and not to their creators. In reality, however, many of these AIs are just powerful pattern finders and amplifiers. That's what they're built to do. Sniff out patterns, find them, show them to us, blow them up, magnify them. And the patterns that they find and amplify, including the racist and sexist patterns, are already there in our social data. So who's to blame for that? So here's a question for you. If you look in a mirror and you see a dirty face looking back at you, what should you do? Break the mirror? Bad mirror. I didn't want to see that. Start an anti-mirror campaign? Clearly, mirrors are dangerous. Clearly, we have to get rid of the mirrors because they're showing us all this ugly stuff we don't want to see. Should we start scrubbing the mirror? Let's make sure we get the dirt off that mirror. Right? That might not be the best or wisest or most direct solution. Should we accept what the mirror shows as inevitable? Oh, I guess we got to have dirty faces. It's in the mirror, what can we do? Or maybe should we try washing some dirt off of our face? Right? And I hope you guys see the comparison here. A lot of the rhetoric around AI and some of the racist and sexist and other damaging uh, tendencies that it may have in our society are really reflections of ourselves. And the important thing is that we use that mirror to diagnose and modify our own institutions, make our world more just, so that what AI reflects back to us can be just as well. So if we do it right, I think that life with AI can be more humane than life without it. But the future of human AI partnership, one that serves and enriches human lives, isn't something that's going to happen organically. We can't just sit back and expect that to be the future that's delivered to us. It'll need to be a choice that we make to improve our machines by improving ourselves. So, Remember what I said about AI being an accelerator. OK, well, what is it accelerating right now? Where are we right now? Right now, we're running downhill on an unstable and windy gravel road with a lot of potholes and cliffs. Those include rising economic and political inequality, unchecked resource consumption and degradation, irresponsible uses of power, short-term social and economic incentives, pollution of the physical and informational environment, 
So what is AI going to do? If we do nothing, what it will do is accelerate our speed along this path toward those potholes and cliffs. So what do we do? We can either resign ourselves to a wreck, or we can commit now to building a safer and better road to travel. That won't be easy to do. It'll take a lot of resources. It'll take a lot of intelligence. It'll take a lot of commitment. But what's the alternative? Just giving up and running our species off a cliff instead? So the critical choice we face, I think, is both our greatest danger and our greatest opportunity. Can humans rise to this responsibility? Yes, they can. Will we? That's up to us. That's our decision to make. So here are some lessons from the AI mirror I want to conclude with. The AI mirror is a powerful diagnostic tool for humans who want to construct better societies and a better world. And in a community like Santa Clara University, this is our mission. And AI is a way that we can leverage that, uh, that potential. But to do that, AI must not be used as a scapegoat for human moral failures, even those that it reflects, magnifies, and perpetuates. We are still the responsible agents. This is good news. So to get to this future, the positive future, we need investment today in human enrichment and ethical oversight of AI. I like to say AI is not ready for solo flight. And we still need to be the pilots. We still need to be calling the shots. Despite its profound risks, though, AI can be a powerful tool for good and a driver of human growth. And trying to make it better can be a powerful incentive to make ourselves better, to make our society better. So what kind of future can we expect from AI? That's the question I posed at the beginning of these remarks. That's still very much up to us. It's always going to be us in the AI mirror. And it's still up to us whether we'll like what we see. Thank you.